Let's get into the word together this morning. If you would, open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter four. I'm gonna read our text this morning, which you'll see it listed on the thing, verses one through 10, but I am gonna touch on verse 11 as well. So let's stand to give reverence to the word of the Lord as we read here Hebrews chapter four, beginning now at verse one. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, for it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege of rest that you give us in following Jesus, after Jesus. And we pray now that this morning you would open up the eyes of our understanding so that we would understand this, Lord, not merely intellectually, but also spiritually, within the heart of every person here, to understand and to gain hold of this rest that you speak of. Thank you for it, Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned last week, in a lot of ways, what we're doing this morning is really a continuation. This is one of the things that I really love about the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a very logical book where each section is built upon the previous section. And last week, at the end part of Hebrews chapter three, we saw him really bring up and begin to emphasize this idea of the rest of the people of God. And what we emphasized last week was how Jesus promises us this rest, and he reveals the key to this rest, that is faith, belief, and what keeps people out of this rest that God has for them is unbelief. But we were very careful to define last week that this idea of faith or belief that God calls us to is that it is not just the idea of intellectual agreement. That is primarily the way that our culture and even many people within the church today see this idea of faith. When I say faith, many people think of intellectually agreeing with an idea or a certain doctrine. Well, actually the biblical idea of faith It includes the intellectual agreement, but it actually goes much further than the intellectual agreement to go on to this idea of trusting in, of relying on, of clinging to. And that's really the idea of when we have our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not just that you agree that he lived and died and was a really real person who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. As it says in another place in the Bible, the devils believe that and they tremble at it. But the difference is is that biblical faith is you put your trust. You trust in who Jesus is and what he did for you, especially what he did for you on the cross. Now, he's going to continue on that idea here, starting in chapter 4, speaking about, look at right there in verse 1. He says, therefore, since a promise of entering his rest remains, or remains of entering his rest. That unbelief kept the generation that escaped Egypt from entering into Canaan. Therefore, this remains, this remains, this promise of entering his rest, and we can enter into it by faith. 
But again, that faith should be understood as trusting in, as relying on, as clinging to Jesus Christ. And I can imagine that this morning I'm speaking to more than just a few people. You understand the intellectual ideas or concepts surrounding the Christian faith. And I'm glad that you do understand them or even agree with them. That's wonderful. But are you trusting Jesus? Do you trust in him today? Do you trust in him for your past, to make sense of your past? Do you trust in him for today and what you might terms in a biblical idea, your daily bread? Do you trust in him for tomorrow and all eternity? That idea of an act of trust, of a relying on Jesus, that's what we're speaking of. And if you do, the Bible says that you are given access, you are put into this place of rest. What is this rest? You know, last week I didn't even really carefully define it. I knew we'd be talking about it more this week. But what is this rest that God has for us that he speaks about in the Christian life? Well, first of all, we should understand it's not just speaking about a a ceasing of activity. The person in the Christian world who has rest is, well, I do nothing. It's not like you're on a perpetual vacation, in a sense, and you're following after Jesus Christ. No, that's not the idea. Some people I know who really grasp this concept of rest, they're some of the hardest working people for the kingdom of God that I know. But they do it with a certain mentality. They do it with a certain spirit. It's all marked by this rest with God. There was an old Puritan commentator and writer named John Owen, and he defined this rest in five ways. And I'll just quickly mention them. He defined them in five aspects. First of all, he said that this rest means Peace with God and a satisfied soul and conscience. I don't know if you know what it's like to live with a tormented conscience. I don't know if you know what it's like to live with this idea that you're not at peace with God, but rest means you know that you and God are right. And it's not based on a delusion, it's based on a biblical truth. Rest also means freedom from a slave-like, bondage-like spirit in the worship and service of God. In other words, we can come to God freely and boldly, and if you want to put it in these terms, with an open heart towards God. That is what rest means. Rest means, thirdly, deliverance from the burden of the ceremonies of the Levitical law. For some people, there's certain aspects of Levitical law that hang over them as if it was a great burden. Rest means you know that these things are fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and it just adds an entirely different dynamic to your life. Rest also means the freedom of true worship of God according to the gospel. And then finally, John Owen said that this rest means that it is the rest of that God himself enjoys. Now think about the rest that God enjoys. It doesn't mean that he has ceased from all activity. God is a very busy God, don't you think? He's at work. He's doing stuff every day. God is very much a busy, involved, you know, working God. Nevertheless, do you think that God is anxious in heaven? I often think about this scene. I often just tell myself it because I need to be reminded of it. That God is not pacing the throne room in heaven, you know, with his hand on his head, worried about how things are going to turn out. You know, thinking, oh man, I had everything going great. And and then they invented the internet. What am I going to do now? I know it's not like God is worried about such a thing. It just doesn't bother him. God is at perfect peace, at perfect rest. It's sort of this state of a satisfied soul that is at rest. And God has this for you. Not a sense of anxiety. Not a sense of fear and foreboding about the future. You could say that this rest that God promises to us, it is only perfected in heaven. That's where it's going to be perfected for each and every one of us. Yet you could say in a sense that this rest is a piece of heaven that God has for us right now. He has it for you. Sort of the existence, sort of the life, sort of the peace, the assurance that we assume everybody will have in heaven. God has it for here, here for you, right here, right now. Now this rest does not mean, and I need to clarify this, rest does not mean an easy life. If you want to confirm that to your soul, think about the life of Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle did not have an easy life. 
Matter of fact, there's a few places in his writings where he describes his life, and you look back and you say, whoa, I don't know if I could handle that. Nevertheless, there is a note of peace and confidence and triumph of an undefeatable man in the Apostle Paul. The kind of man who can say this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What can you do against a guy like that? If I live, I'm going to live for Jesus. If you kill me, well, then I gain heaven. It doesn't matter to me. I'll take it either way. Such a man has such a rest, such a peace in his soul. And I would say this, he cannot be defeated. That's why this rest is so profound. It's so great. It's so meaningful in the Christian life that that's why he says here in verse one, did you see this phrase? Let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. This place of rest in the Christian life is so wonderful that it should concern us when we or when others seem to come short of it. It isn't enough, it isn't enough to almost enter into this rest. You don't want to come short of it in any way. And it's kind of funny. I I see the followers of Jesus today worried and concerned about many things. And some of them are very legitimate things to be concerned about. They're concerned about the state of the church. They're concerned about biblical faithfulness. They're concerned about cultural dangers. They're concerned about this aspect of the church or that aspect. And I'm not going to say that those concerns are necessarily illegitimate. Many of them are very well founded. But I just thought to my mind when I read this, when's the last time that somebody really worried over the fact I have not entered into God's rest? That I'm living an anxious, worried, deprived, conscience-stricken Christian life, then that's not what God has for me. God has for me a place of rest. You know, sometimes we act as if it's the job of the preacher, and in some sense it is, to, to sort of calm anxious souls. And that's true. I hope I create some anxiety in some of you here this morning. I want you to be worried if you don't have this rest. I want you to understand that there's something that God has for you in your following of Jesus Christ that if I could be so bold to say it, it's your birthright as a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have it, it should bum you out. If you don't have it, you should have a determination rising up in your soul saying, God, you've appointed this for me. Why don't I have it? Now, I would say this, that some people have this rest, obviously, And some people don't. You know, this passage to the Hebrews makes no sense whatsoever if no one does actually come short of it in some sense. Now, as I say those words, I'm a little bit cautious about them because we are always careful about implying that there are sort of the haves and the have-nots in the Christian life. But certainly, you can't read a passage like this without coming to the conclusion, not everyone has this rest, but God intends it for everyone. Now, why doesn't everybody have this rest? Well, some people don't have this rest because they have never given their lives to Jesus Christ. They've never initially put their faith in him. It's as if Jesus says, here I am. I took the punishment on the cross. I I took the pain and the judgment that all your sin deserved. I took it on myself on the cross. And now I call you to myself, Jesus says. I call you to trust in me. I call you to trust in what I did for you on the cross. And some people have never really done that, at least not in the sense of, trusting in, relying on, and clinging to Jesus Christ. I bet if we could pass out little slips of paper with, you know, boxes you could check. Did Jesus of Nazareth live? You check, yes. Um, did Jesus of Nazareth die on a cross? Yes. Did, did he you check all the right boxes on that. And wonderful if you do. But do you trust him? Have you put your trust in it? And some people have never done that initially. And by the way, let me just say this. If you never have, then why would you delay another day? Why would you not put your trust in such a wonderful Savior? Here he is right now, right here for you, for you to trust upon. So some people have never put their trust in Jesus. But then there's other people. There are other people who actually have this place of rest in Jesus Christ. They do. They just don't really know the theological or the biblical terminology around it. And I bet that that's more than just a few people here. As you hear me talk about this, you think about it, you sort of look within your own soul, and you're wise enough to not only look within your soul and soul, but to ask the Holy Spirit to look into your own soul and to speak to you about it. Because sometimes we don't even judge accurately our own condition, do we? 
But even right now as I'm speaking, you're sort of having a conversation with the Holy Spirit, which I don't mind that at all. I recommend it highly. You're having a conversation with the Holy Spirit, saying, Holy Spirit, if this is me, would you please speak to me about it? I want to know. I want to know if this is me. And you have an assurance. No, you do have this rest. You've just never been able to articulate it in this kind of biblical terminology. That's okay. You know, one of the things I'm very grateful for in the Christian life is that we can actually have and apprehend a spiritual experience even if we don't know exactly how to describe it biblically. Isn't that beautiful? That that, uh, following after God isn't merely a theology test. Now, I think theology is very important, but we're not limited by a lack of knowing how to describe things until we can actually live it. But then there's other people who don't have this rest. They trust Jesus in a general sense, or especially in a past sense, for their sins and for their salvation, but they're not trusting him right now at the particular point where God calls them to trust him at the particular moment. And if I could say this morning, those are the people that I'm especially concerned about, and I think that the writer of the Hebrews is especially concerned about. He says, you gotta grab a hold of this. Just as he says here in verse two, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. In other words, in the wilderness, Israel heard the word of God. They heard God's good news of how they could enter into what God had for them, yet so many of them didn't believe him. They didn't trust in God. And this tells us something very heavy. It tells us that hearing God's word isn't enough. Those words seem strange for me to say. I'm a preacher. I love to talk to people about God's word. But hearing God's word isn't enough. Even though I'm delighted that I trust you're hearing it this morning, you've got to receive it by faith. It's not just hearing, but it's receiving by faith and then actually do it. I mean, ancient Israel heard the word of God, but as the writer of the Hebrews says, it did not profit them because they did not receive it with faith. Hearing gave them the opportunity, but the opportunity only was provided to them or fulfilled, I should say, if it was mixed with faith. Did you see that phrase in verse two? where it was mixed with faith. Ancient Israel, it says that it was not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. In other words, you can hear God's word. You can even hear amazing preaching, yet it may do a very little effect in your life, and it may not bring you into this rest that God has you until you hear the word and it is mixed with faith. You know, I I love the history of God's working in his church through the centuries. And I think back, I take a special interest in thinking of God's great preachers that he raised up. And if you know me, it's no mystery to you that I have a special fancy for Charles Spurgeon, that great preacher of Victorian England. I mean, I I quote him all the time. It, it, It became such a joke in my Bible college classes when I was in Germany that if I didn't quote Spurgeon in a particular class, students would want to know what's wrong. How come he didn't quote Spurgeon in this particular class? But I think even if I could be transported back into a time machine and sit in that congregation in London and hear Charles Spurgeon preach with his own voice and in his own words, that great preacher might do of no, have little effect in my life if the word he spoke, I didn't mix it with faith. Now look, I'm all for preachers trying to be the best they can be and working hard to be good preachers. But can we be honest about something? Sometimes the problem isn't with the preacher. Sometimes the problem's with the hearer. And two people can sit side by side and hear the same word of God. And for one person, it delivers them. It leads them into rest. It is of tremendous spiritual profit to them. And the person sitting right next to them, it does very little for them. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith. I like what the old commentator Adam Clark said about this word mixed with faith. He says it has the idea of digestion. In other words, we can eat the food of the word of God, but without faith, we don't really digest it the way that it does, the way that it should be in our life. And sometimes this faith comes suddenly. Sometimes you just grab a hold of it and say, yes, I believe, I believe these words. But you know, sometimes this faith comes very gradually, doesn't it? I remember hearing the case a few months ago about a man talking about C. Everett Koop. Do you remember him? He was a Surgeon General of the United States, and he was a wonderful believer. 
but, but he wasn't a believer all of his adult life. And, and this is how he described his conversion. See, Everett Koop described his conversion this way. He started going to church with his wife. And when he first walked into that church, he heard the preacher preach, and this is what he said to himself. He said, I don't agree with just about anything that this man is saying. In other words, I, I disagree with him almost on every point. But, you know, out of, you know, kindness to his wife or just wanting to be together as a family, he kept going to church. And about a year later, he sat in the church and it suddenly occurred to him, I agree with almost everything this man says. You know, there was no dramatic moment of faith that he could point to. But just over time, now he's coming to that position of faith. And for some of you, it's that way. And to me, it doesn't really matter much whether you come to a point of immediate faith or whether it's been a gradual work in your life. I'm just saying that today, today, you need to have that faith. Because without it, all the spiritual opportunity, all the privilege will do you no good. Israel came out of Egypt with so much triumph, with so much celebration, yet that first generation could not enter into the promised land because it wasn't coupled with faith. And this is why he continues on in verse three, continuing on that same theme. He says, for we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. You see, verse three says it very powerfully there. We who have believed do enter this rest. This is a contrast. Some people are kept out of the rest by unbelief. Some people enter into it by faith. And please notice, it's by faith. It's not by religious ceremonies. It's not even necessarily by church attendance, but it's by faith. And they enter into what God says is his rest. Did you notice that phrase in verse three where he says, my rest? Very plainly and powerfully, he says, they shall not enter my rest. That demonstrates that the rest is God's. It belongs to him. It's the same kind of rest that God enjoyed when he finished the work of creation. It's the same kind of rest that he offered to Israel coming into the promised land. It's the same kind of rest that's held forth for the people of God in Psalm 95. This rest remains for the people of God. And you could say that the rest is after the pattern of the rest that God had on the seventh day of creation when he rested from all his works. Now going on here now to verse six. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Friends, here's the point. God did not create this place of rest in vain. He did not make this opportunity for people to be at peace and at ease of conscience and of great confidence of God. He did not create this place so that nobody could enter into it. No, he made this place so that all who believed him could enter into it. And so he speaks to you and I today, verse seven, today if you will hear his voice. Again, he's drawing on Psalm 95, proving that this rest remains for us and we can enter into it today. And it's when we trust in Jesus the way that we should. Aren't you grateful that the test for entering into this rest isn't how smart you are? Well, some of you would be in by a long shot. Others of us, well, we'd have a hard time. Aren't you glad that it's not necessarily how pure you've been morally in your past? Some of us would be excluded. Others of us, we'd do pretty good. Aren't you glad that this place of rest isn't given this requirement or that requirement or another one, but it's really something that's accessible to each and every one of us. Every single person in this room can put their trust in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm gonna admit, for some people it's easier than others. Some people, because of maybe just the way that they are as a person, they find it easier to trust Jesus. Other people, maybe it's because of the experiences of their life. I readily agree. For some of you, it's easier than others of you to put your trust in Jesus. But I guarantee you this, everybody here can do it. Everybody can have this relationship of trusting, love in Jesus and enter into what he has for you. Look at it there in verse nine. 
There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. You see, together, this proves that there's rest for the people of God, a rest that's spiritual, yet it's patterned after the rest that God gave to Israel under Joshua. Now, I don't know if you've done much study on the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua concerns Israel coming into the promised land. Uh, Previously here on Sunday mornings, we talked about the book of Exodus. And that was all Israel coming up out of Egypt. So they came out of Egypt. They were in the wilderness for a whole time for a generation of unbelief to die off. But then a new generation that would trust God, God brought them into the promised land under Joshua. And this is the pattern that God gives for us too. The man of unbelief must die so to speak, in the wilderness, so that under Joshua, under our Jesus, we are led into the promised land. Did you know that the names Joshua and Jesus are identical in the ancient Hebrew? Jesus would be called Joshua. Jesus is just the Greek way of saying the Hebrew name Joshua. When Jesus grew up and around his home in Nazareth and all that, everybody called him Joshua. And isn't this beautiful? that there was an Old Testament Joshua that led the people of God, those who would believe him, into this place of rest, and now God has it under our Joshua, Jesus the Messiah. And so it's another beautiful idea that not only is Jesus superior to Moses, as we've seen in previous weeks, but we can also say that he's superior to Joshua because Jesus leads God's people into a rest that's far greater than Joshua ever did. You could say that Canaan was a picture of this rest. The Sabbath day was a picture of this yes rest. The year of Jubilee was a picture of this rest. Yet all of these are pictures. The reality is Jesus. It isn't about a geographical place. You don't have to go and move to the land of Israel to be in this rest. It, it isn't about a day of the week. You don't have to wait for a certain day of the week to have this rest. No, it's not about geography. It's not about a day of the week. It's not about a season of life. It's about Jesus. But I tell you this, pretending you have this rest, that won't get it for you. Spurgeon, see I'm going to quote him right now. <laughs> Spurgeon told a story about an old preacher who was given an assignment to speak on the subject. Here was a subject Joy in God. And as this godly old preacher stood up before the audience to speak to the congregation about the subject, joy in God, he stood before them and said this, I am sorry that I've been requested to speak upon this topic, for the sad fact is I am not walking in the light, but I am crying, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I have grieved my heavenly father and I am in the dark. Wouldn't that blow your mind if the preacher got up and said that? Spurgeon said that the man then sat down and cried and he said there wasn't a dry eye in the entire congregation. Spurgeon said about this, he said, quote, this honest confession did far more good than it if he had patched up a tale and told of some stale experience years before. If you have not entered into this rest, do not say that you have. And that's my word to you. To me, it's, um, it's maybe completely understandable from sort of a human nature standpoint, but it's sad, even tragic, how often we'll pretend with ourselves even within the walls of church, or maybe I should say, especially within the walls of church. How many people are afraid to weep a tear over their spiritual condition? Why? Because it might mess up their makeup. I I wish I could say that that only applied to women. These days, you can never really tell. (laughs) But how many people are ashamed to to truly allow themselves to be broken in any visible way before God because they wonder what others would think about them. Let me say two things about that. First of all, who cares what others think about you? You are a soul dealing with God. Secondly, 
have you not deceived yourself about what others would think about you? Would not others find such a stirring joy in their heart and instead be led to stop pretending for themselves and say, Lord, take me just as I am. Friends, if you don't have this rest, please don't sit here and pretend that you do. Would you come with a broken, honest heart before God? And whether you can sense unbelief on your part or not, just come honestly before God and say, God, you have this for me, and yet I do not experience it. Would you please break me and mold me until I trust you the way that I should? Look at what he says here, verse 10. For he who has entered his rest had himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. What do you do when you're in this rest? You cease from your works. Now, please understand, it's not that you stop doing good works, not at all. No, matter of fact, I would say you should do more good works under this rest than otherwise. But you stop from your self-justifying works. I was searching for a way to illustrate this, and I couldn't think of anything better, so I'll just give a personal example, and I hope it's not too personal. But it sort of strikes from my own heart. I'll explain why. Just, just this last week, I got a letter from a woman that I donated a kidney to about a year ago. It was the first that I ever heard from her. And it was weird, because there were just some strange mix-ups in the delivery because you kind of have to do it through intermediary and such. And so it really just reminded me, honestly, I mean, I just forgot all about that. I did. I did a little over a year ago. To me, that's like ancient history. Let's see what's happening today. But this letter from this 33-year-old woman and just how um, thankful she was that she no longer had to be on dialysis and how she could be there for her nine-year-old son and how her nine-year-old son didn't have to worry about her being stuck at the hospital or dying because she was on dialysis. It was just very, very sweet. And I thought back to that thing that I did of donating a kidney. And I said, David, did you do that to try to justify yourself before God? In other words, did I do it with the thought, oh, God will love me more. Oh, this will get me into heaven. And friends, I can say that as much as I can read my own heart before God, which isn't perfect, I can say, I did it for none of those reasons. I really believe that for whatever reason I did it, I did it out of the rest that God has given me in Jesus Christ. Out of this place of peace and just clear heart before the Lord, just to say, just to say, God, I know you love me. I know you're with me. I know your grace is poured out upon me. What good can I do for someone else? So please, understand. I believe that we do works from this rest. Sometimes even wonderful works. But they're not done with the sense of justifying ourselves or making us right with God. No, instead, verse 10, he has ceased from his works as God did from his. I believe God is still busy at work. But God isn't justifying himself. He is at peace. So verse 11, and we're going to end with verse 11, but we'll pick it up at verse 11 next time where it says this. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Friends, God has this place, a place of rest, of a peaceful conscience, of a lack of anxiety with God and this world He has that for you in Jesus Christ. Let's be diligent to enter it. You're not going to fall into it. There's going to be a sense of diligence where you have to be sort of rigorous with your own heart and your own mind saying, no, I choose to believe on Jesus. But let me say this, and I'll sort of conclude with this. You can't really put your trust in Jesus until you've taken it off of yourself. And this is a stumbling block for many of us, isn't it? There still remains within us this desire, this instinct to trust ourselves and our own wisdom and our own abilities. No, God helping us will say, Jesus, I renounce this trust in myself and I look to you. I look to who you are and what you've done for me and that is my trust. Father, I pray that you would take this word this beautiful word about the rest that you have for us in Jesus. 
And Lord, I have to say, I feel weak. I feel unable to adequately explain this. I pray that in and around any of the words I've spoken, that your Holy Spirit has done a work here to, to explain it with a precision and with a persuasiveness certainly greater than what I possess. But Lord, I simply ask, here, now, would you help everyone here in this room now to be honest with themselves about where they are and how they need to trust in Jesus? Reveal to us specific points in our life where we need to exercise that trust. Some of them may be familiar, some of them may be a surprise, but Lord, would you please reveal it? Lord, my earnest desire is that every person here who hears us would truly enter into that rest. Would you do it among us? Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.